Well, thank you so very much. Thank you, Monica, for the very, very kind introduction. What a fantastic, fearless voice for liberty, Monica. And what a blessing it is to be with all of you. You know, the scripture tells us where two or more are gathered in his name, he will be there. And there are a lot more than two of us here. It is a real honor, it is a pleasure to be here with you, to be joining you today. You know, many of us, we go to church. On Sunday, we'll see the pastor going back to the original Greek. If you look to the etymology of the word politics, there are two parts. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> is a fairly accurate description of Washington, D.C. So welcome to the swamp. The place that combines southern efficiency with northern hospitality. You know, these are extraordinary times, aren't they? The threats we're facing in this country are unprecedented. For five years, we've been trapped in the great stagnation, millions of Americans struggling to get jobs, struggling to achieve the American dream. Abroad, we see our foreign policy collapsing. Every region of the world is getting more and more dangerous. And America, for five and a half years, has failed to stand with our unshakable ally, the nation of Israel. And we are seeing at the same time Liberty under assault. We're seeing our constitutional rights under assault like never before. What I want to talk to you about today is one aspect of liberty that is imperiled like never before and that is precious and cherished by every one of us, and that is religious liberty. There is a reason why the very first provision of the Bill of Rights, the very first phrase in the First Amendment, protects the religious liberty of every American. Because we were formed by people from all across the world fleeing religious oppression and coming to a land where every one of us could seek out the Lord God Almighty with all of our heart, mind, and soul. You know, I've been blessed for much of my life to have the opportunity to stand up and defend religious liberty. When I was Solicitor General of Texas, I was honored to defend the Ten Commandments monument on the state capitol grounds. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won 5-4. When a federal court of appeals struck down the Pledge of Allegiance because it includes the words one nation under God, we went to the U.S. Supreme Court defending the Pledge of Allegiance and we won unanimously. And when a federal court in California struck down the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial, a 70-year-old monument, a lone white Latin cross to the men and women who gave their lives in World War I, I was honored to represent over 3 million veterans. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court defending the Mojave Desert Veterans Memorial, and we won 5-4. Today, the threats to religious liberty are even greater. And I want to talk about them both here at home and abroad. Here at home, we have an IRS who is asking citizen groups, tell me what books you're reading. Tell me the content of your prayers. Let me tell you something, the federal government has no business asking any American government. Last year in Alaska, an Air Force chaplain posted on his blog the phrase, there are no atheists in fossils. He was ordered by his commanding officer to take that down. I guess it was deemed insensitive to atheists. You know, I kind of thought it was the job of chaplains to be insensitive to atheists. <laughs> 
to welcome them into the forgiving arms of a loving God. But it's very interesting to look at the origin of the phrase, there are no atheists and fossils. It came from a 1954 speech to the American Legion given by President Dwight Yazman, a man whom I might know had some passing familiarity with the military. In the course of that speech, President Eisenhower described the story of the four immortal chaplains. That story arose from the USS Dorchester. That in World War II was hit by torpedoes from a German U-boat as it came around the southern tip of Greenland. And the Dorchester began to sink. And they realized with horror that there were not enough life jackets aboard for all the men on the ship. There were four chaplains on the Dorchester, two who were Protestant, one who was Catholic, one who was Jewish. Each of those four chaplains, when they realized there weren't enough life vests, each, each of them took off his life vest and gave it to another. And then they stood arm in arm and they sung hymns as the four chaplains went down with the ship. And the origin of that story is that when those chaplains were handing their life vest to another, they didn't ask, are you a Protestant? Are you a Catholic? Are you a Jew? They simply stepped forward and sacrificed their lives to save the life of their brothers. That's the origin of the story. That is the American tradition. The idea that our federal government is coming after religious liberty now is just astonishing and heartbreaking. You know, you look at the intrusions on religious liberty that are represented in Obamacare. Take Obamacare. Please, take Obamacare. <laughs> you know, the U.S. Supreme Court is considering right now the case of Hobby Lobby, of Christian owners that have stood up and said the federal government cannot force them to pay for and provide abortion-producing drugs to their employees. The Obama administration is litigating against them to try to force them to violate their religious views. There's another case that's even more stark, the Little Sisters of the Poor. This is a Catholic convent of nuns who've taken the vows of poverty. They devote their lives to caring for the poor and the elderly, providing health care. And the Obama administration is litigating against them, trying to collect millions of dollars of fines to force these Catholic nuns to pay for abortion-producing drugs and others. Let me give you a simple rule of thumb. If you're litigating against nuns, you have probably done something wrong. And then you look at the threats to religious liberty abroad. Right now, all of us are horrified by watching what's happening in the nation of Iraq. As ISIS, a group of radical Islamic terrorists so extreme they were thrown out of Al-Qaeda, is systematically taking over more and more of that nation. Their stated objective is to create an Islamic caliphate that runs from Syria to Iraq, and then to work to exterminate Jordan, Israel, and ultimately America. In the 1990s, there were roughly 1.2 million Christians living in Iraq. Today, there are fewer than 300,000. Christians are being persecuted in stunning numbers. They are being stoned, they are being tortured, they are being beheaded, they are being crucified. That's what is happening for people speaking up for their faith. And it's not just people from other nations. Pastor Saeed Abedin, he's an American, an American citizen, a resident of Idaho, Pastor Saeed was in his native country of Iran building an orphanage when he was sentenced to eight years in prison 
for the crime of sharing his Christian faith. Eight years in prison. His wife and his two little kids live in Idaho right now. I had the opportunity to sit down and visit with them and his wife. She shared a story before this sentence where she and her husband were both captured in Iran, were threatened with prison together, and were told, if only you will renounce Christ, we'll let you go. And they both said no. She described how one of the commanding officers who captured them asked all the other army officers to leave. And he sat down at the table with the two of them and said, tell me about this Jesus. As Pastor Saeed languishes in an Iranian prison, while the American government negotiates with the government of Iran, a negotiation that I think is only increasing the likelihood of Iran developing nuclear weapon capability that will gravely threaten the national security of both Israel and the United States. Our president and our government have not been able to secure the release of an American citizen languishing in an Iranian prison simply for his Christian faith. Now, I'll tell you something incredible. During the time Pastor Saeed has been in prison, he has been able to lead dozens of fellow prisoners and prison guards to Christ. Amen. And then you look to another example. The example of Miriam Ibrahim. Miriam Ibrahim is someone every elected official, every American should be speaking out. Mary Abraham is a young woman. She's a wife, she's a mother, and she is in prison in Sudan for the crime of being Christian. Miriam has a 20-month-old son, his name is Barton, and she has a newborn baby daughter, Maya. Miriam gave birth to baby Maya just a few weeks ago in a Sudanese prison while in Lagos. Miriam and Martin and Maya are in that prison right now today. And the government of Sudan has sentenced Miriam to 100 lashes and then hanged by the neck to for the simple crime of being Christian. You know, for all of us, our faith is an incredible part of who we are. And yet few, if any of us in this room, have ever had faith tested like that. Miriam has been told you will be spared this horrific sentence if only you will renounce Christ. And Miriam has told her captors, I cannot and I will not renounce Christ. Every one of us needs to be lifting Mary and Abraham up in prayer. But every bit is important. We need leadership in America. The President of the United States should stand up and speak on Mary and Abraham. Miriam is married to an American citizen from New Hampshire. Miriam's two babies are American citizens, and they are languishing in a prison in Sudan waiting for their mother to be whipped and hung to death. We need to speak out against these atrocities. We need to speak with one uniform, powerful, clarion voice for freedom, and we need the President of the United States to say in no uncertain terms, send Miriam home. Yeah. Let me 
to say finally two things. Number one, men and women here, every one of you is a leader. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a rabbi, whether you're a business leader, whether you're a mom. Every one of you here is here because you believe in faith and freedom and the principles that have built this country and made this country strong. At no time in our nation's history have we seen the threats to liberty, religious liberty and every one of the Bill of Rights, more dire than they are right now. And the reason I'm here today more than anything else is to tell each and every one of you to encourage you. Every one of you is here, and every one of you in your communities has been placed in a place of leadership. Just like yesterday, for a time such as this. That's why you've been called to leadership, to speak out and to speak the truth. And the last thing I want to share is I want to share a story that my father often tells. Many of you have gotten to know my father. He's very shy and soft-spoken. <laughs> He's a pastor from Texas who has seen the evils of totalitarian government and who speaks out for freedom. This is a story he often tells from the pulpit with respect to salvation, but it applies in many contexts. It's a story of a tightrope walker who sets up a tightrope across a gigantic waterfall. And a crowd gathers for and he asked the crowd, he says, how many of you believe I can walk across this tightrope in the back? The crowd cheers. And he does it. He says, how many of you believe I can walk across this tightrope in the back pushing a wheelbarrow? The crowd cheers. And he does it. He says, how many of you believe I can walk across this tightrope in the back pushing a wheelbarrow with two 100-pound bags of sand in the wheelbarrow? crowd cheers, and he does it. He says, how many of you believe I can walk across this tightrope in the back with a man in a wheelbarrow? The crowd cheers, and he points to a man in the front row and says, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> and the point, obviously, is that believing, whether in the context of salvation or in the context of standing for our liberties, for our constitution, believing is not quietly doing the golf clap. Believing is not sitting on the sidelines saying, yes, yes, I believe, I believe. Believing is stepping forward and getting in with your heart, mind, and soul, putting everything you have. Believing is getting in the That's what y'all are doing each and every day, and that is what it is going to take across this nation, awakening and energizing the American people. I believe, I'm convinced we are going to pull the United States of America back from this precipice, back from this abyss, but it is going to take each and every one of us speaking up in our communities, energizing the people. It is going to take each and every one of us Get in the wheelbarrow. And I just want to say thank you and God bless you as together we work to save the greatest nation in the history of the world. Thank you.